Tally, thank you so much. Having run a gallery for just shy of 14 years, uh, which was 10 years ago, I know the kind of work that goes into doing these types of exhibitions, and I can't tell you how much I appreciate Tally and the entire staff here. <laughs> it's incredible. I did everything at my gallery. <laughs> so this has just been beautiful. Uh, I kind of feel like an insect over here. <laughs> Let me just say, this body of work, this is the first body of work I've made that addressed war as a subject, uh, coming from it as an artist. Um, about 10 years ago, I, I have curated a number of exhibitions as part of my artistic practice that dealt with the subject of war. One was here in Dallas uh, in 2011, I believe. The Oak Cliff Cultural Center had just opened and I proposed an exhibition there to look at uh, the broad subject of war. And then in 2013, uh, a German art dealer who was crazy enough in Chelsea to want to do an, a war exhibition asked that we propose uh, a war exhibition in New York City. And uh, Charles D. Mitchell is my uh, collaborator. He and I co-organized both exhibitions. And the one in New York City dealt uh, with a more narrow subject of the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. And it was a, it was a tough show. Uh, it caused quite a stir. We got a lot of press and, and it was just too idiots back in Texas <laughs> wanting to curate this exhibition. But I thought I was sort of through with that subject matter and as far as it being a part of my artistic practice to co-organize shows, but when you do that amount of research over so many years, I kept finding myself going back to my archive, going back to my notes, looking at, at war, and I started thinking about how would I approach it myself as an artist as opposed to a curator. And my other work, uh, which I've done up to this point, has been more in the public realm, not so much in the gallery. It was intentional because I had run a gallery for so many years. I was trying to, for myself, sort of uh, twist that, make it more difficult for myself and, and do projects outside the gallery. But when this body of work came around, uh, again, my other work has taken the form of maybe a farm field, uh, a field guide and a fly poster farm. These were all public art projects and they were, uh, some of them were supported by the City of Dallas Office of Cultural Affairs, which is great because they're now supporting artists to do exhibitions and uh, projects in Dallas, public art projects. So really, essentially, those two parts of my artistic practice had a baby. <laughs> the, more, the more public realm, nature-based work, and the, the subject matter of war, and this is kind of the result. And I was sort of trying to find a way into the subject matter. Certainly, the, the exhibitions that we did had a lot of tough imagery, and they wouldn't be what they they wouldn't be an honest depiction of war if they didn't have that kind of content. And it wasn't my work, it was the uh, work of about 12 contributors. So I started thinking about this and thinking about how can I trick people into looking at this work that might address really important, for me anyway, the, the issues of our day, which is the war machine, the American militarism, uh, all of our wars. And I took the dates of the last 100 years and it's significant in that we're really kind of looking at modern mechanized warfare and that really started with World War I with our first uh, mass production of tanks and planes and bombs. Uh, so 2017 marks that centenary, that 100 years of U.S. wars. So I'm looking at that, I'm looking at how we conduct war, where we've conducted war, I'm also looking at uh, you know the, the weapons manufacturing industry. So some of these pieces address, um, well, there's lots of bombs, because we're really good at that, right? <laughs> there's the cluster bombs, those were early on. Uh, we're still using cluster bombs. They were invented uh, during World War II. Uh, this one is actually referencing the daisy cutter bomb. Beautiful name, but <laughs> it actually is the largest non-nuclear bomb that we have. And it was just replaced by uh, the massive ordnance air blast, which some people know is the mother of all bombs. But anyway, from 1970 to uh, 2008, we actually used the, the cluster bomb. And these, again, the 100 years is 100 years of aerial warfare. We really started that with the First World War. So the cluster bomb itself just obliterates everything, every life form, everything around it. And when we've used it, some of our allied forces thought we'd actually dropped a nuclear bomb on the Gulf War, but it was simply our most powerful bomb. So I'm, I'm looking at things as a way to get into them that's approachable, and hopefully I'm using imagery of flora and fauna to sort of trick you into looking at this subject matter, which is, which is very serious. I mean for these to be funny, too. Even though the subject matter is so serious, we're talking about U.S. warfare, but 
I have to admit, I, in my studio, I'm usually, I'm busting out laughing when I'm working on these pieces. And I, really recently, I almost got kicked out of the George W. Bush archives at the Presidential Library for laughing too much. Because <laughs> I'm looking at documents. Much of this uh, subject matter comes from declassified documents, uh, things that were revealed by whistleblowers and journalists and so forth. Uh, the secret war in Laos, we of course didn't know about that until that was revealed by journalists. Um, even now, it depends on what administration is, is in power and how much information they want to put out there. So even during the Obama years, which saw a lot of bombing, uh, we've now kind of put a tamp down on that information that's coming out. So the General Accounting Office can't really track what we're doing. We don't know what we're doing. So it remains a really important issue. And a lot of these pieces sort of deal with the antecedents of that. Uh, maybe some of the first bombs, the first planes, the first tanks. Uh, they deal with operations. And they also address uh, chemical warfare, biological warfare. And, and again, it's my way of just hoping to get people interested in the subject matter because I'm sort of marrying that along with this delicate imagery. And I can spend great amounts of time just painting. I had to teach myself to paint again for two years, because I hadn't painted in maybe 15, 20, I'm lying. <laughs> so that itself, I fell in love with painting again as an artist, which I probably never thought that would happen. I had intentionally been making work that didn't fit that category. I was making public art projects and so forth. Anyway, it's a gesture for me. It's here for you. If you want more information, there's a supplemental um, notebook over here. And of course, you can ask me any questions. I want to keep my remarks short, but enjoy. Thank you. Thank you. Questions. I'll take a couple questions. Uh, what's the connection between the insects and animals in the morning? Well, the best way for me to describe it is there's a concept. It's a, it's a feminist critique. Uh, there's actually a, a feminist social critic, and she talks about veganism and the meat industry, and, and there's a concept called the absent referent. And the absent referent is when you name all your planes after ospreys or uh, hawks or eagles, almost every one of our planes, including the 7,000 unmanned aerial systems that we have, much of the operations or the planes or the weaponry is actually, it's, the name of them are birds of prey or operations, Operation Big Buzz. These are some of the biological. So when you couch things in that absent referent, you're sort of missing the true violence of it. And I'm the first to admit war is seductive. At the same time, it has consequences. And, and, and so I'm trying to use that flora and fauna imagery as a little window into that subject matter. But again, our military names many, many things after flora and fauna, operations and all the weapons. Didn't you, all, you also shared with me a story about how the government actually used insects as a weapon. Like with the malaria, was that the mosquito? Yeah, well, we did a lot of um, this. There's a piece right behind there. It's uh, Operation Dropkick. It was a series of uh, biological uh, warfare experiments we did in the 50s. And then we used a lot of that in Korea, in North Korea during the Korean War. We haven't really admitted it, but there's a lot of documentation that suggests that's the case. Those were all secret biological uh, experiments. This piece right here actually is the latest in our biological warfare. And this is uh, defense, DARPA, which is the defense agency of the Department of Defense, does a lot of research. That's where, you know, lots of things have come from, some that are good for human beings and some that can be weaponized. But right now they're taking insects and in the pupae stage, in, in the, 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 before they become a moth, they're implanting electrical mechanical systems. And then when they grow into a moth, you can then control those. You could have a swarm of 50 moths and they could be weaponized or they could detect chemical weapons. So there's always, you know, there's a, there's a good thing that comes out of a lot of this research, and then when it gets weaponized and used against humanity, it can turn the other way. Anyway, I'm done. If anyone else wants to ask me any questions, just come up and I'll point you to the book or I'll answer them. And we're gonna go in the other room right now and the other artist is gonna speak.